Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Design Histories of Modern and Contemporary India. Today we have with us Nancy Adichania and Professor Tapati Guhatakurta. Let me introduce Nancy. Uh, Nancy is a Bombay-based cultural theorist and curator. She has curated a number of major research-based exhibitions, including the recent Nali Setna retrospective, the unpaved, crusty, earthy road, Chatterjee and Lal with Simrosa Art Gallery, Bombay, 2021, through which she has questioned the received narratives concerning Setna's works and created a new framework within which to situate it. Using empirical evidence, Adhajanya has proposed a radical interpretation of Setna's career as an expanded collaborative practice, which she defines as the Nelly Setna studio. This curatorial research potentially opens up new possibilities for art history, as well as crafts history and the history of textile design in India. Her curated exhibition, Counter Canon, Counter Culture, Alternative Histories of Indian Art, Serendipity Art Festival Goa 20, 2019, celebrated the many alternative histories of Indian art experiment and collaboration, which arose from diverse locations between the 1940s and the 1980s in India. Trade fairs, interdisciplinary workshops, art activist collectives, documentary cinema, underground filmmaking design, architecture schools, and youth subcultures. Adhijaniya has proposed several new theoretical models through her extensive writings on subaltern art, media art, public art, collaborative art, transcultural art, the Biennale culture in the global south, as well as the interstices between art and design. Her essay, Dashrat Patel's Non-Aligned Alignments, retrieves a pioneering moment from the exhibition history of world fairs as part of a prehistory for new media practices in India that lies outside the domain of the visual arts constructed by its gallery sanctioned practitioners. Today, her lecture affordances degrees of freedom wrested from phantom narratives. Uh, Adhijaniya will, uh, sorry, Adhijaniya will present the Madhya Pradesh Tribal Museum in Bhopal, and she will also um, use it as an example of an infrastructure marked by Deridian ontology. The museum's express purpose is not only to preserve and collect the endangered art forms of the states of Madhya Pradesh and neighboring Chhattisgarh, but also to breathe a new life into them. This is achieved in the main by an exhibition design whose ethics and aesthetics claim to reject the conventional museum model. Um, we also have with us Professor Tapati Guhatakuta. And before we start, um, I would also like to thank our outreach partners, uh, NID Ahmedabad and the JBMRC Kolkata. A uh, few house rooms, um, all the viewers can type in their questions on Zoom in the chat box or the question answer box. Those who are following us on Facebook can also type in their questions there and we will try and accommodate as many towards the end of the session. I hand over the evening to Tapatidi to welcome Nancy and then we will go. Nancy to the series. Um, it's really great to have you on board with your many levels of expertise in curating and doing exhibitions. I had the opportunity to visit this particular museum that you're going to be talking about and making it a site for thinking more broadly about collection, preservation, and life in museums. So over to you, Nancy, and we hope we have a good discussion at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ushmita, for this kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Tapati, uh, whose work has always inspired me. Uh, and um, uh, thank you for inviting me to the Design History Symposium. So uh, my lecture is titled, Affordances, Degrees of Freedom Rested from Phantom Narratives. In 2018, I visited the Madhya Pradesh Tribal Museum located in Bhopal in central India. I was curious about the museum's mandate as reflected in its curatorial approach and exhibition design. 
Next, please. The museum's express purpose is not only to preserve and collect the endangered art forms of the states of, Mahar of, of Madhya Pradesh and the neighboring Chhattisgarh, but also to breathe a new life into them. It ambitiously rejects the conventional museum model where objects come to die, so to speak, and puts in its place a collection of liveliness. This mandate is especially salient as Adivasi communities such as the Gond, Pardhan, Bil, Bega, Saharia, and Korku, among others, form 21% of the population in Madhya Pradesh and nearly 31% in Chhattisgarh. And yet the MP Tribal Museum remained haunted by unresolved narratives, the specters of long running discussions and the demons of socioeconomic asymmetry. In this paper, I present the MP Tribal Museum as an example of an infrastructure marked by a Deridian ontology. Most institutions carry within them the phantom presence of seemingly defunct philosophies and the currents of ongoing debates. In an additional layer of meaning, I have encountered in the interstices, cusps, and thresholds between these haunted and haunting histories, a series of affordances rested by the con contributing artists to articulate their own agency as they shape to their advantage, the institutional infrastructure established by the architect and the exhibition design team. This additional layer of meaning adds complexity as well as ambiguity to the experience of the MP Tribal Museum. By affordance, I mean a, a capacity latent within an environment which may be activated by any being that regards that environment, however temporarily, as its habitat. These affordances could be conceptual, visceral, spatial, infrastructural. Some may lie unused and unrecognized forever. Others may spring into life in the appropriate circumstances. Next, please. It is these phantom histories and affordances that occupy my attention here. I shall also propose two further and potential spaces of affordance for the museum, which I have designated as the room for rebellion and the room for, for Jangar. Next, please. We arrived along a curved driveway at the entrance of the Madhya Pradesh Tribal Museum. Next, please. The facade of the building, which was inaugurated in 2013, is lavishly animated by a grand tableau of images. Each image, a painted cutout, children hiding in trees, women with winnowing pans, grazing animals and guardian figures with tridents, the entire mural dynamized by the onrush of a long meandering river. Next, please. Created by the well-known artist Durgabai Vyam of Pardhan origin, these cutouts inhabit their own mythopoetic time and are silhouetted by the auspicious digna pattern, a corded and crenellated line with which Durgabai's community decorates the walls and floors of their village homes. It was fascinating to see how the digna pattern had migrated from its original ornamental function in domestic spaces to the MP Tribal Museum mural. Next, please. Durgabai and her husband, the artist Subhash Vyam, first experimented with this pattern in their illustrations for the graphic book on the life of the revolutionary leader, Dr. Baba Saheb Ambedkar, who fought against the pernicious caste system. To begin with, the Vyams happily disregarded the Western convention of using strips of boxed in panels. After much brainstorming, Subhash came up with the idea of the Digna pattern as a mode of generating a fluid paneling method. In the tribal museum cutouts, the versatile Digna pattern appears variously as a separator, a bridge, and an aureole around the figures. Next, please. While the wall text provides the origin myth of the Narmada River, 
considered one of the of one of India's holiest water bodies. The credits mention Durgabai and others in a tiny type size, disregarding the artist's development or agency in formulating a language of her own. This parsimonious type size emphasizes the museum's valorization of the community over the individual artists, uh, over the individual artistic subjectivity, rendering the latter almost anonymous. For those who do not know of Durga Bai's struggle to become an artist, the exhibition didactics turns her into a simple custodian of its timeless and presumably unchanging folklore. Next, please. To further complicate matters, the origin myth of the Narmada River, the origin myth of the Narmada River on which the Vyam's mural is based, is a story of betrayal. I was startled by the strategic positioning of this myth, an ambiguous sign at the very entrance of the museum. For those who are interested, I will narrate this uh, story uh, in the discussion session. Normally, one might as next please. Normally, one might assume that a tribal museum would greet viewers with a rhetoricity of cosmic inclusiveness using archetypal motifs from the web of life. On the other hand, I think, how appropriate, given the colonial and post-colonial states, state's history of visiting systematic oppression and marginalization, false promises and broken treaties on the community, on the communities designated as tribal, was this an expression of institutional intentionality? In a conversation that I had with Durga Bai, I learned that she had proposed several mythic narratives. The Narmada story was chosen from among these by Mr. Harchandan Singh Bhatti, who is effectively the exhibition designer and curator of the museum. It is most likely that Bhatti chose this story to emphasize the sacred aspect of the river rather than fold an indirect political critique into this Mise-en-Seine. Next, please. Next, please. I entered the museum pondering over the name nomenclature you, I, I entered the museum pondering over the nomenclature used in its title. The English word tribal encodes everything from paternalism to exotic romanticization to genocidal ambition. While the general understanding is that tribal communities and Indian society lie outside the pale of caste society, the reality is that they have historically been caught up in an uneven process of economic and social transition between forest dwelling, pastoral, and caste-based agrarian ways of life. During the colonial period, the tribal communities were alienated from their habitat, denied access to forest pr produce, and the forests were turned into profit-spinning plantations. If the term tribal is a colonial construct, its official Hindi translation, Janjati, with its associations of a clan-based group, carries a connotation of exotic primitiv primitivism, implicitly contrasting it to Jati, the caste system that defines mainstream Hindu society. On the other hand, the more popular term Adivasi, literally the first inhabitant in Sanskrit, could be proposed as an alternative to Janjati. This term was first used during the nationalist struggle by the Gandhian social worker Evi Thakkar uh, when he was working with the tribes of Chota Nagpur in the 1930s. Actually, he began working in the 1920s um, uh, already uh, during the nationalist struggle. And uh, the Gandhian approach towards the Adivasis marks an insidious infantilization of the tribal communities who have produced leaders in every century, some of whom organized the Santal and Munda uprisings that shook the British colonial regime during the late 19th century. Next, please. After independence in 1947, the term Adivasi found robust articulation in the voice of Jaipal Singh Munda, himself a member of the Munda tribal community from Chota Nagpur 
and the president of the Adibasi Mahasabha in 1938. During the deliberations of the Constituent Assembly of India in 1946, he reasoned, sir, if there is any group of Indian people that has been, that has been shabbily treated, it is my people, close quote. The bitter truth is that 75 years after independence, the Adivasi communities, which constitute 8.6% of India's population, according to the 2011 census, continue to be oppressed and marginalized. Displaced from their land by big dams, heavy industries, and mining, corpora and mining corporations, exiled from the forest by colonial era forest acts, forest acts forced by Hindutva militants to return to the Hindu fold uh, in a specious claim of original identity and caught between the Mao Maoist insurgents on the one hand and the Indian state on the other, they have fought back and attempted to resist all forms of authority and exploitation. Next, please. Durgabai's mural reveals several forms of betrayal folded into it. The Narmada story reminds us of the people's mass movement in the 1980s. The Narmada Bachao Andolan, in which Adivasis facing displacement due to the construction of a large scale dam across the Narmada River and its tributaries in Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra, opposed the project vehemently and demanded compensation from the government. Even if this inaugural mural was never meant to be a provocation, I recognize in a flash that it is the first of many affordances that the visitor will encounter in this museum. Next, please. Next, please. While the tribal museum seems to exert its exclusivity as a living museum, it is haunted by another cultural institution of iconic importance, which has had its moments of incandescence in Bhopal. I'm alluding to, the, to Bharat Bhavan, a multidisciplinary arts center founded in 1982 by the legendary, uh, founded in 1982 and designed by the legendary architect, Charles Correa. Next slide, please. At Bharat Bhavan, which stands not far away from the tribal museum in Bhopal's elite Shamla, uh, Shamla Hills district, its visionary director, the artist and cultural activist, J. Swaminathan, found the Rupankar Museum. In an unprecedented move, Rupankar showed works by academy trained metropolitan artists and works by so-called folk and tribal artists in adjacent galleries. Next, please. This was a radical redefinition of contemporary art, uh, of, not only of the contemporary art, but of the contemporary. This was a radical redefinition of the contemporary at a time when a strict hierarchy was observed in India between art and craft, urban and rural, anglophone and vernacular. As the cultural administrator and poet Ashok Vajpayee, who played a formative role in this institution explains, until then, a pecking order function such that the modern in the National Gallery of Modern Art, Delhi, was perceived exclusively as urban and therefore contemporary. And the works of the folk and tribal artists at the Crafts Museum, Delhi, were seen as craft and therefore rural and traditional. Next, please. Despite this radical departure at Bharat Bhavan, it must be mentioned that these two sets of artists were shown in adjacent galleries and not literally positioned side by side. Thus, Bharat Bhavan had missed the opportunity to bridge the distance between the respective art forms. I asked Ashokji if given the chance to restage Bharat Bhavan's inaugural exhibition today, would they do things differently? Yes, he affirmed and reiterated that a pluralistic approach is paramount. It was this pluralistic approach at Bharat Bhavan, at Bharat Bhavan that nourished the remarkably gifted painter, Jangar Singh Sham. 
Jangar would travel from Patangar to Bhopal at the invitation of J. Swaminathan to join him at Bharat Bhavan. Next, please. Unlike the practitioners of Varli or Mithila art, Jangar Singh Sham could not call into play existing community traditions of ritual paint painting that could be used as convenient points of departure. The Pardhan community uh, were not traditional painters, although Jangar did make clay relief works on, wall, on the walls of his house. They were the hereditary minstrels and balladeers of the Gonds. Through his magnificently expressive oeuvre, Jangar created a new iconography based on the creatures and gods that haunt Pardhan folklore and myths, as well as, as well as his childhood memories of the Narmada River, the animals, the birds, and the trees. His artistic development was also enriched by the ongoing exhibitions of contemporary art, music performances, and multilingual theater repertoires and poetry festivals that he could savor at Bharat Bhavan. As Shampa Shah writes, Jangar took to listening to Pandavani and other folk singing traditions with narratives from Mahabharat, the, Bhartri, the Bhartrihari Shatak, ballads of local heroes, and he also saw plays by stalwarts like B.V. Karanth, Habib Tanvir, and others whose rehearsals he would often attend. In the process, Jangar pioneered a new idiom of painting. As his projects expanded in scale, he brought together, trained, and mentored a number of his, of, uh, of, of his fellow pardons, including uh, relatives like Durgabai and Subhash Vyan. Jangar's wife, Nankusya, is, uh, is Subhash Vyam's sister. The style with which they are associated has been mistakenly called Gond art with the suggestion that it goes back to time immor immemorial, when in actuality, its, its only real origin lies in Jangar's experiments, for which reasons the poet Udayan Vajpayee correctly calls it the Jangar Kalam or the Jangar style. Durgabai Vyam has expanded the Jangar Kalam by investing it with her own gendered subjectivity, as have a number of the other acolytes and apprentices from Jangar's circle. Jangar went on to show in major national and international exhibitions, including the famous but controversial Magicians de la Terre in Paris in 1989. But not all the affordances of Bharat Bhavan could save him. The pressure of market forces, his own vulnerable position as an Adivasi artist, despite having achieved renown, and his inability to say no, finally took his life. Next, please. Next, please. He committed suicide at the age of 40 in Japan's Mithila Museum in 2001. What was ostensibly called an artist residency was, uh, was as his wife and artist, Nankusya says, a place where they made him work like a laborer, Mazduri Karvati the. They did not look after him as hosts would or should have done. They forced him to make, within a few weeks, works that would have taken a few months to complete. Close quote. Next, please. A room for Jangar, who inspired many of the artists showing their work at the MP Tribal Museum, would not have been out of place. The gesture would on honor his brilliance and act as a cautionary tale, not only to the art world, but also the citizens of this country. The supremely cluttered foyer of the MP Tribal Museum gives us a foretaste of the chaos that continues to grow as we pass from one of the institution's six galleries to the next, traversing cultural diversity, tribal life, tribal aesthetic, tribal spiritual world, Chhattisgarh Gallery, and arriving at the Raku Gallery, dedicated to Adivasi children's games. 
giganticism and proliferation seem to be the key drivers of the museum's exhibition scenography. A mammoth gone granary that feels like an unintended ironic gloss on Adivasi hunger. Next, please. Bill votive offerings piled high and multiplying rapidly through the gallery like ghosts of unfulfilled wishes. Next, please. A fertility bangle traditionally made by the Bhareva, Jara, and Garwa communities of MP and Chhattisgarh magnified here to look like a Ferris wheel. By turning a ritual object into a hypertrophic art installation, the museum has reduced it to a kish, to a kish, uh, to a kitsch, to a kitsch fetish. If indeed it was felt that this object should be made relevant for contemporary times, the Adivasi artists could have been consulted to reinterpret this object in the age of endangered agricultural practices, climate change, and vampiric capitalism. Next, please. On the other hand, the installation based on the bill myth about the community's ancestors coming down to earth to bless people and cattle is relatively more successful. Tiny ancestral figures travel along fierce blood streams gushing out of a gigantic headless sculpture. Next slide, please. Based on the artist Buribai's painting of the same subject, an imaginative rendering of the myth, this three-dimensional manifestation has a powerful, powerful performative dimension. What destroys it though, are the lurid lights which imbue the installation, installations in this museum with an unfortunate air of theatr theatricality. Next, please. What is the real subject of the tribal museum? What is being museumized here? Is the museum trying to offer a simulacrum of the lived environment or life world of the Adivasi communities? This is a heroic but doomed project. The forces of modernization and urbanization have destroyed that world while their culture has been, muse has been embalmed in museums. In its mission statement, which is full of contradictions and windy abstractions, the Tribal Museum presents itself as, and I quote, the bridge of dialogue between the two streams of life, tribal and the modern philosophy of life, close quote. While wishing to initi initiate such a dialogue, the museum remains trapped in essentialist dogmas. According to them, modern urban life is based on scientific views and tribal life on mythical views, close quote. Next, please. This is a static ahistorical view. The Adivasi consciousness can hardly be untouched by the forces of modern life. And it is not lacking in a scientific understanding of its ecosystem. And the modern sensibility is often marked by unscientific prejudice, superstition, demagoguery, and is also sustained by its own mythology of aspiration and success. In a desperate attempt to produce a living museum, the exhibition scenography has tried to tweak traditional museum approaches to retrofit its purpose. Consider the following, consider the following museal and ar archeological hauntologies. The Sonne Lumiere shows at Indian archaeological monuments, which were designed for outdoor evenings, have been accommodated to all-day interiors, making for a garish, lurid effect. The diorama model has been amplified massively, such that the viewer is made to feel that she is herself a figure in a gigantic di diorama. What is meant to be what was meant to be an immersive effect with the aim of lessening the distance between the city dweller and the Adivasi life world comes across as an oppressive experience in which the viewer is overwhelmed with material excess. Organic and inorganic elements compete for space and attention, 
straw, plywood, clay, bamboo, iron, dried branches, leaves. Next, please. The full-scale model, the full-scale models of houses belonging to the Gond, Bega, Saharia, Korku, and Bil Adivasi communities clustered together and bathed in red and blue lights add to the sense of clutter. Clearly, the curators have not learned the lesson of less is more from the Adivasi building techniques and spare domestic interiors that they display with such elan. elan. The sheer overproduction and waste of material and artistic labor is staggering. Next, please. In the name of creating a collection of liveliness as against a sanitized white cube, uh, there is something new being produced all the time. Artists are engaged in stone carving or making furniture for the canteen or making plywood branches for a tree. We could speculate that in trying to recreate the magic of Adivasi animism, where nothing is inanimate and everything is live and has a soul, the museum was allowed to run wild like an overgrown forest. As though at some subliminal level, the Adivasi other was being imprisoned in a dark and mysterious primitivist fantasy. We grow increasingly sad as we walk through this haphazard simulacrum of a forest illuminated by an artificial sunlight and an artificial moonlight. Next, please. Harchandan Singh Bhatti, who was responsible for the exhibition design at the Tribal Museum and also currently is in charge of the Rupankar Museum at Bharat Bhavan, was mentored by J. Swaminathan. Next, please. In the early 80s, Swaminathan had assembled teams of young artist researchers to assist him in building up a collection of Adivasi art for Bharat Bhavan. He had devised an orientation course for them, which comprised lectures on anthropology, sociology, and folk art. This course enabled Bhatti and his uh, fellow artist researchers to develop an eye for collecting art and objects of everyday life for the museum collection, and also for identifying unrecognized talent in the villages of Madhya Pradesh. Next, please. In asserting the right of artists of so-called tribal background uh, to be seen as individual contemporary artists, Swaminathan sometimes argued that their creativity should be viewed as autonomous of an ethnographic account of their lives and circumstances. Of course, he remained Swaminathan remained fully cognizant of their socioeconomic struggles. Indeed, his championing of their right to imaginative self-fulfillment was an expression of a pro-Adivasi politics, as many of his essays attest. But he was a complex thinker. Swaminathan was not the uncritical primitivist he sometimes made out to be. More of a romantic, he was perhaps you could say more of a romantic realist. However, Jen, who is a former director of the Crafts Museum Delhi, is right to critique Swaminathan's emphasis on the formalist aspect of tribal art over its ethnographic context. This strategic move made by Swaminathan in response to the deep-seated social and aesthetic prejudices that tended to fix folk and tribal art as craft has not eventually helped to advance the cause of Adivasi art, which in comparison with Indian modernism has its own distinct historical trajectory, one which is marked by ruptures and experiments rather than by some illusory traditional continuity. At the Tribal Museum, and uh, we must add at a time when there are a number of Adivasi artists in Madhya Pradesh who have received a measure of success in the post uh, Bharat Bhavan experiment, Bhatti has gone to the other extreme in reversing his mentor's strategy. Ethnographic context dominates the wall text, while the Adivasi artists' formal and political choices are not given much consideration or rather any consideration. And the tribal gallery at the Rupankar Museum in Bharat Bhavan uh, 
uh, more of a multipurpose hall than a white cube is replaced with the chaotic galleries at the Tribal Museum. Next slide, please. Buribai 70 foot long autobiographical mural painted along the long enfilade on the ground level has escaped the museum's strongly ethnographic bias um, and composed itself across the museum wall, like a long sentence punctuated by a series of intensities. Buribai is one of the first women painters from the Bill community. In the early 80s, her husband um, brought her to Bhopal to work as a laborer on the Bharat Bhavan complex, which was then under construction. Next slide, please. While she appears in the mural, bottom extreme right, carrying a head load at the construction site, a figure resembling the architect Charles Correa is shown in one of the building's uh, domed structures with a pair of dividers. It is not unusual to see un underpaid and overworked women head loaders on Indian construction sites. What is unprecedented though, is the miraculous transformation of a laborer into an award-winning artist. Next slide, please. In the run-up to the inauguration of the museum, the tribal, MP Tribal Museum in 2013, 1,500 artists from MP and Chhattisgarh came in batches to work for two years on its artistic interiors. Bhatti expresses his delight, and I quote him, when we asked tribals to help for the construction of the museum, we realized that even masons and homemakers had an artistic inclination and could make int intricate designs on walls and wood, close quote. He thus reasoned that, and I quote, unlike the plain walls of the city houses and museums that are decorated by an interior decorator, by an interior decorator uh, he would let the tribal artists decorate the museum, close quote. The museum's curator, Ashok Mishra, emphasizes the role of the artist decorator in the making of the museum. And I quote, visitors who come here often speak to the artists and hire them to decorate their offices and homes. Bollywood actors like Rani Mukherjee and Jackie Shroff, who visited the museum, were so impressed by it that they asked the artists to do the interiors for their homes in Mumbai. Close quote. Next slide, please. This instrumentalization of Adivasi talent and skills and the channelizing of these artists into the function of interior decoration tends to reinforce the prevailing misunderstanding that such, art, that such artists who have individuated themselves to exemplary struggles are no more than interchangeable bearers of inherited myths and crafts. It also paves the way for a deliberate and disturbing blurring of the boundaries between artwork, installation, and mise-en-scene. By rendering these three exhibitionary categories unstable and therefore confused, the curator exhibition designer is able to exert disproportionate power over what is shown and how it is to be shown. From its inception, the museum has propagated, so to speak, a counterintuitive Magritian mantra. This is not a museum. To emphasize its continuous growth, presenting itself as a hybrid space, a museum that is also a hectic production system. But hybridity has its consequences and such a stance cannot simply wish away the questions one would legitimately ask of a museum. Where does the museum shade into the karkhanam, a word used both for the painterly ateliers of the Mughal empire, but also as a humble a word that is used for a humble workshop or a factory? Where does the curatorial mandate end and the artistic desire begin? Although the institutional rhetoric suggests that the artists are equal partners in the making of the museum, it is the scenography that dominates and controls the exhibition narrative. The individual artworks and with them 
artistic agency are subsumed into the overpowering installations that proliferate in a fashion that embraces disorder as an organizing principle. This blurring of exhibitionary cat categories creates a series of problems in terms of accession, documentation, and conservation protocols. With the distinction between object and scenography eliminate, eliminated, how are these installations to be classified in the access, accession register? In a situation of ceaseless production, where is the line between the changing display, the permanent collection, and the reserve collection? Are the wall murals ephemeral or permanent? If they are ephemeral, can they be replastered and remade annually? What then of the authorial signature of the individual artists who is not interchangeable with, with fellow artists? And how will the museum cope with the on-site installations, which given their heterogeneous material and improvised techniques uh, would inevitably pose a, a conservation nightmare? Next, please. Uh, how am I doing with time? Okay, I think I have lots of time then since I haven't received a response. Um, I think we are on 10 minutes, Nancy. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, the slide, of course, uh, features Revti Kamat, the architect of the, of, the, of the Tribal Museum, MP Tribal Museum. Um, some of these anxieties that I just aired um, uh, have been also uh, must have uh, you know um, uh, must have bothered the architect of the tribal museum, the late Revti Kamath as well. Shocked by the congested interiors where some of the smoke detectors were covered by the display, and apprehensive about the fire suppression system, Kamath had written uh, early on. Kamath had uh, written early on to warn the authorities about the building's vulnerability to a major fire hazard. Next slide, please. Actually, Kamath's museum design is very generous and hospitable to the needs of the Adivasi communities. It could be read as a series of clusters built around a sequence of three voids that are open to sky in varying degrees. A funnel-like void for the auditorium, an atrium with a water body at the center, and an amphitheater. The museum laid out over a sequence of galleries and courtyards exudes transparency and fluidity. As the uh, architecture historian Madhvi Desai observes, and I quote, the, gal the galleries are raised above the ground on columns forming a continuous multi-leveled veranda, close quote. The vast double height gallery spaces reveal Kamath's desire to make the exhibition spaces participatory by enabling, and I quote, the tribal, by enabling the tribal communities to represent themselves and express their own ideas and way of life, close quote. Much of the museum rhetoric regarding a living heritage or living traditions is presented through a series of affordances embedded in Kamath's built fabric itself. These can be activated by artists, curators, exhibition designers, and viewers. Among these affordances are spaces of sociality where artists can gather and converse, occasions of amusement where audiences more used to popular environment, popular entertainment of the Disneyland variety are not alienated by classical museum displays. The double height galleries uh, could be turned into multi-level spaces equipped with viewing platforms and observatory perspectives by curators to generate unexpected sight lines and forms of scenography. And thresholds of intimacy uh, can also be activated uh, by young people uh, who can paradoxically craft privacy in a, in a public space. In her essay on the tribal, MP Tribal Museum as a dating venue, Ina Ross shows how dating couples appropriated the museum space and made it their own. Next slide, please. 
while we wrestle with the ethnography over art narrative of the tribal museum or the phantom narrative of art over ethnography as, in, uh, as institutionalized by Bharat Bhavan, the story that has gone missing from the representation of Adivasi art is the ethnography of rebellion, by which I mean the forms of political resistance that Adivasi communities evolved to combat the colonial and the post-colonial state. This is over and against the customary ethnographic study of their social customs, religious rites, and cosmogonic, cosmogonic views, which are all abundantly attested to at the tribal museum. Even before the Gandhian reformers descended on the Adivasi communities in the early 1900s to civilize them, they were perfectly, the Adivasis were perfectly capable of producing their own leaders and leading their own uprises, uprisings against colonial administrators, local landowners, and moneylenders who brutally exploited them. I would cite here the Santal Rebellion of 1855-56, led by the Murmu brothers, which importantly took place before the first Indian War of Independence in 1857, and the Munda Rebellion, led by the legendary freedom fighter and leader of the millenarian uh, movement, Birsa Munda, in the late 19th century in Jharkhand. And in the post-independence period, Adivasi women have played an active role in fighting the repression of the Indian state, whether during the Narmada Vachao Andolan in the 80s or during the spirited agitation of the Dongriya Kond uh, in Orissa, which succeeded in ousting the mining giant Vedanta from the sacred uh, Niyamgiri Hills in 2013. In Chhattisgarh, Adivasi women have survived sexual violence and and other brutal human rights violations because of the intense militarization of the region by the state in a bid to counter Maoist insurgency. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. While avoiding the art ethnography binaries of Swaminathan and Bhatti, I would like to clarify that my proposal for a room for rebellion in the tribal museum should not be misconstrued as another simplistic dichotomy, uh, one, that, uh, one where Adivasi art is seen to be radicalized only when it comments on political urgencies. As I have shown, Adivasi art has never been stagnant. It has always responded to its own way, in its, in its own way, to unfolding cultural and political changes. Nor is Adivasi art that deals with the origin myths or cosmogonies apolitical. On the contrary, the animistic beliefs of the Adivasi, uh, Adivasis function, in effect, as a system of checks and balances against the ruination of the earth unleashed by the forces of the capitalist scene. As compared to their urban fellow denizens of the planet, the Adivasis are better equipped to grasp the, danger, to grasp the dangers of the capitalist scene era through their myths and folklore, which emphasize the ethic of interspecies coexistence, but also from having historically faced displacement and dispossession. The room for rebellion would gesture towards making space for dissensus and dissent. It is a modest proposal for a change in curatorial strategy, one which could accommodate and annotate the historical and political agency of the Adivasi people and their artists without pandering to the facetious dichotomy of ethnography and art. Next slide, please. In the print media and in my conversation with some of the artists, their instinctive grasp of the, affordance of, of the affordances made possible at the museum is very palpable. By inhabiting a museum solely devoted to tribal art, they have the freedom to walk in and out of the space without the burden of comparison with other kinds of artists. Within this zone, they are emancipated from the deficits they have to negotiate perennially elsewhere regardless of how successful they have become. They do not need the validation of an Anglophone metropolitan art world in this space that ostensibly belongs to them and which they have made their own in, actu in actuality. 
when we see the artists sitting in the canteen or standing in front of their works and conversing with curious viewers, we know they have a strong sense of ownership towards the museum. The beggar artist, Ladli Bai, proudly declares, this is not a sangrale or a museum, but our ghar, our home. Things are changing in villages, but here our children and grandchildren and grandchildren will know what our culture, past and present means." Close quote. One way to look at the tribal museum is to see it as the artist's home, a place they have decorated with their own hands. But we also know that it is, it is a home whose contents are framed by somebody else, whose identity is always already determined. Consider the persistent vocabulary of, vocabulary of tribal, janjati, primitive, innocent, spontaneous. We also know that the museum uh, is, is, is a space uh, where, whose inhabitants are aware that, aware that the curator patron giveth and the curator patron taketh, taketh away. That while uh, the exhibition designer will create uh, messy interiors to unmake the museum's uh, white cube dogma. Uh, he expects you to behave yourself and draw within the boundaries of the designated grid. Next slide, please. The artists seem to be adept at playing along. They are able to tell the difference between an, between an opportunity and an affordance. The former is an official guarantee against precari precarity, the latter a site of genuine, even if temporary freedom. When the idea of instituting the tri MP Tribal Museum was in its initial stages, Buribai asked a pertinent question. Shouldn't the Tribal Museum be made by the tribals themselves? Close quote. Her words ricochet against the museum walls under an artificial sun. Thank you. Thank you for a truly thought-provoking uh, presentation, Nancy, on a very complex space uh, as I encountered it uh, some years before you did. But it would have been, I went there uh, with Hari in 2015. Uh, you open up a very central conundrum if I may call that, between a museum that enables a community to participate, so the participatory aspect of a tribal community to enter, make, construct, and in some sense to inhabit it and feel a sense of ownership over it. And another way uh, you have an overarching sense of architects, curators, and designers who are ultimately uh, like a director in charge. You know, they are choreographing it, they are producing the scenography. Now, I see this as a very productive tension to say that if this is not a case where one can entirely erase the other. So when so I'll begin on a very personal note and I'm happy to then let the others come in. That as you rightly said, it is the starkness of the contrast between Bharat Bhavan and the Janjati Sangrahalai, which I saw Bharat Bhavan several years ago, and after seeing the Janjati Sangrahalai, I returned there. And this idea of hanging paintings on a wall, which is what Bharat Bhavan did with uh, the artists like uh, Ram Singh Urveti, Jangar uh, Singh Shyam. So ultimately it was about uh, putting, as you say, modern and contemporary Indian art and contemporary tribal art in a common venue, if not on the same platform. Clearly there were different rooms and surely Swaminathan and Ashok Vajpayee would have reimagined it three decades later. Now you contrast that and the contrast is very, very striking between 
a sense of, you call it chaos and disorder. I got a sense of a sensuous exuberance. Uh, and maybe I was not coming with an adequately critical eye. I fully accept that. But I got a sense of a certain, that disorder, that chaos, that crowding of objects and walls and so it part of a certain sensory experience um, and a certain form of immersiveness. Now, if I was to put those two qualities there, as against this question of chaos, overcrowding, disorder, that is produced by an alternative curatorial vision and which the participating artists are meant to contribute towards, right? So in both cases, perhaps to lesser or greater degree, the tribal artist is being pulled out of a collective, given an individuality, but nonetheless being made to feel part of a group. So I'm wondering that this productive tension between the two museums and the inevitably unequal relationship between those who design, curate, and are not part of the community, and those who are coming in to work. And you interestingly made the distinction between what is an artwork, what is an installation, what is scenography, what is mise Now, obviously, each of these terms are loaded terms, the artwork. And you also mentioned how the artwork gets lost in scenography. So somewhere in your uh, narrative and your analysis too, there are different aesthetic criteria and there are different notions of what even an alternative museum could do. Now, and therefore ultimately you fault the museum for doing, going in a particular direction, but perhaps not doing enough so that somewhere the participating artist remains trapped in an already defined scenography within which they... So the idea that they produce the museum, which is the point at which you ended, Kuri Bhai, or Ladi Bhai sense that sense of ownership, this is not a Sandraha uh, This is not where uh, we are objectified. This is where we can belong and work. Now the inequities of work direction are fully taken. But if you think of the long journey of the anthropological museum from the diorama and the craft personnel's work and the tribal personnel's work to their incorporation within an aesthetics of modern and contemporary, uh, I'm reminded a bit of the much debated show of uh, modern and tribal art that James Clifford critiques where Picasso's and African masks are all brought together. Here they're not talking about influence, they're talking about it. To one more type, which has dismantled the diorama, the tribal on view, the tribal as individuated artists with an artwork into producing what you may think of as a model a chaos, doesn't give adequate room to dissent and dissensus, to rebellion, all of which are taken. But I'm just thinking about whether the museum space at all. Then what we are critiquing is the form of the museum itself. And of course, and the public it brings, the forms of viewing it takes. Uh, what is the experience of inhabiting a museum rather than walking through, right? To so I would raise these as questions to you in terms of what we take away from a museum like the Dentati Sangrahala and the huge amount that may still be left to be done if we were to literally undo the walls of the museum. So let me put it at that and see whether Ushmita wants to come in and we'll get you to respond and then we'll take larger questions from the chat box. I would uh, like Nancy to respond because I got logged out several times. I missed a bit of uh, your questions and your observations. Uh, once Nancy responds, I mean, maybe I can ask my, give my own observations and response. Okay. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Tapati. I mean, this was such a lovely response. Uh, and, um, and I think that you've uh, really read uh, the, my various positions, even within the paper, all the different routes I've taken, uh, the detours that I have made. Uh, you, you followed me on the various genealogies of, uh, the, of the tribal museum, or the, the various genealogies of the of the term itself, Adivasi itself. Uh, so, uh, but 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 one of the things that perhaps I would like to say is that uh, while you are completely correct about uh, in the way you've interpreted my paper, uh, the one thing that I have done within this paper is to not just merely talk about the chaos and the clutter, and because I did not just simply want to. I did not just simply, uh, you know, just want to dismiss or critique this museum. Uh, I brought in the trope of affordances. And by doing that, uh, I'm not just, again, being this kind of sovereign art historian theorist who is, you know, who has this Olympian viewpoint and standing on a mountain and, you know, theorizing. Instead, uh, by bringing in the trope of affordances, uh, I'm, let, I'm, I'm keeping myself open to this clutter and chaos. And that is why uh, I have both statements at the end, largely by talking about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, owning the museum, seeing it as her own ghar, and uh, Buri Bai saying, Saying, shouldn't a tribal muse, uh, museum be built by the tribals themselves? And um, since this is the design context, I think that perhaps we also need to uh, uh, put in per, uh, some rudimentary concepts in, uh, into play uh, in this context, that when we're talking about the design context, what we have are the, the client and the users are the key figures. And uh, sometimes their desires and needs get entangled, and at other times, they don't. Now, uh, who is the client here? First of all, who is the architect? The architect, as I said, is Revti Kamath. Who is the client? The client is the MP Tribal the Museum. Uh, who, uh, who are the users? All of them. The curator, the exhibition designer, the contributing artists, the viewers, all of us. And uh, when, we, when we look at this, the, the design of this museum, and you know, the design and the curator, curatorial approach sort of blur into each other, uh, what, what you actually see is that there is no singular design paradigm at play. Mm -hmm. And I would actually say that, that, that there, is a there is a kind of uh, porosity and a ductility uh, to the design. And uh, it's a design which, is, uh, you know, which, which, which displays a certain openness to entanglements and to improvisation and therefore to affordances affordances which can be then the latencies within the museum infrastructure which can then be activated by everybody. So, uh, the, and, and to begin with, it is Revti Kamath who in a way has generated those affordances through her very hospitable and um, uh, you know, generous uh, architectural plan. And uh, with, with her multi-level verandas, uh, with uh, her double height uh, galleries, that's why Mr. Bhatti and others can create these observatory platforms. That is why they can create these multiple sight lines. Uh, you know, so, 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 so first, the, the, you know, I mean, there are all these latencies which are in a way generated by the architect, the way I read it. Uh, and I wish Revti hadn't passed away because I would have loved to have a conversation with her. Uh, uh, she she died recently during the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and um, and then to move on to, um, uh, to from from the from from the architect, the curators, and the exhibition designers. Now, they, of course, they overwhelm us, as I said, with giganticism, uh, with proliferation. I love the way you said that for you, uh, as against this kind of sanitized white cube of the of Bharat Bhavan. Uh, what what you like about uh, the museum is this excess of stimuli. Uh, kind of multi-sensory stimuli, which, uh, which, which, which is, which perhaps you prefer to the more, uh, you know, this quieter, sanitized white cube environment of Bharat Bhavan. Uh, but what also happens with this overproduction? Of course, you also have to understand that there are many, many reasons. They are not merely aesthetic or design reasons. Overproduction is also because uh, you know you don't want to just give your largest to a single artist or a single group, but to as many groups as possible, who then become your loyal members of your museum. You know, so the, this this karkhana, this overproduction that is happening there. You know, where every minute you just look around, you're sitting in the canteen, somebody's making something. You know, uh, somebody's making something in the workshop. So all of this is also in, in, in a way uh, you, you know sort of uh, it's 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 also a way in, the, in which the artists are made complicit within the the museum narrative 
and its ecology. Um, but again, uh, and, and that is the reason I don't dismiss Mr. Bhatti's efforts. And that's why my paper is so multi-layered and complex. Uh, you know, uh, actually, he's, he, he's also a friend of the Adivasi artists. And that is why I also draw the genealogy. Uh, I show how he was a student of Swaminathan's and he was there at the beginning when he did this research uh, in the run-up to the Bharat Bhavan Museum. So, and, and he does have that empathy because I've spoken to him. So I'm not merely dismissing or critiquing his efforts either. Uh, I'm trying to see things from as many perspectives as possible and in as complex a manner as possible. And most importantly, to the trope of affordances, also looking at what I call the in interstices, the cusps, the thresholds, the ambiguities. And if you see my writing over these few last few decades, ambiguity is a very important trope for me. You know, so uh, maybe when I was in college, I would have dismissed the festivals of India and I said, oh, this is all exotic primitivist uh, rubbish, right? But that was in college. Then as I started practicing, you know, uh, artistry, cultural theory, um, I, I, then I write this paper on Dashrat Patel, where I talk about how, you know, he should be seen uh, within the prehistory of new media art in India, uh, the, the experimental installations that he was making uh, for the Montreal Fair, for instance, and, and many other things, but I won't go into, uh, you know, my bibliography, but to, to just come back to this point, and therefore, yes, to look at the interstices, the cusps, the thresholds, to look at uh, what is inquiet, but also articulated, to look at what is deliberate, but also uh, not deliberate and unintentional, and, but, and yet uh, it, it, it allows the users to, uh, to, to, to be benefited from that. You know, so, uh, so and, and of course, my two proposals, you know, which is the room for rebellion, uh, like would would a Shantibai or a Raj, uh, Shantibai's work uh, on the Maoist insurgency or Rajkumar's work on climate change and the Maoist insurgency, would they find a place uh, in uh, in the MP Tribal Museum? Uh, so, th so these are these are questions that I ask. Also, a room for Jangar, uh, you know. So, uh, so again, I, I do all of this in a very affirmative. Uh, uh, manner, you know, uh, it is not done uh, in a way to just simply dismiss the effort. I also understand all the entanglements, the friendship, the solidarity, the curator, exhibition designer being a friend, but also Mukadam, you know, uh, a, a distributor of state largest. So, 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 so I, mean, I, I provide, I, I, I provide uh, as complex a picture as possible, so that even my reader or my viewer here, who's listening to this lecture can uh, you know, inhabit the various cells of, of this universe that I've, the textual universe that I have created, you know, uh, and then make up their mind or like this beautiful response that you had, you know, when you said, I want to be you know, overwhelmed by this multi-sensory stimuli. Uh, and, and I like that response, you know. Um, so uh, if I may just say a few more things about uh, Revti Kamath and because this is a design history is a symposium and then uh, I'm very happy to take more questions. Uh, since I didn't have time, I couldn't go into all those things. Now, I talked about how design, you, the key figures are the client and the users, I said, right? Now, Revti Kamath, uh, Tribal Museum, of course, she made only in 20, uh, 20, she designed in 2013. But when she was a young uh, architect in the early 80s, uh, Revti uh, uh, designed um, a settlement colony um, in Anangram. And this was done in a participatory dialogic mode. It was a settlement which was made of, uh, you know, for this itinerant community of artists, magicians, puppeteers, balladeers. And these were people who had, whose uh, colony had been, housing colony had been demolished during the emergency in 1976. So then uh, Raji Sethi's Sarthi uh, and, um, the, you know, um, the Revti and Basan Kamath's uh, architectural group um, and also DDA and the, these, uh, this nomadic community itself, they came together and formed an organization called the Bhule Bisre Kalakar to fight for their rights, the right to accommodation, to right, right to livelihood and so forth. So uh, uh, Revti, as a young woman, worked with them and... Uh, you will find a lot of uh, research material on this. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's very, very inspiring. And I would say students of architecture and design and artistry should look up all, all this material that exists, uh, where you, you have these doodles and sketches that the, uh, these itinerant artists made of what is home? What does home mean for them? What are their memories of home, of belonging? And they would talk about the angan, the, the tree in the courtyard, or, you know, I mean, 
you know what is uh, you know what is what are inner spaces and out, uh, outer spaces uh, they even used uh, the hand span so when devti asked them about you know i mean how how do they measure the space so there's this beautiful sketch from this one of these itinerant artists who made a hand span and of course the symbolic uh, connotation of the hand span is that everybody's hand span is different and therefore you have all these diverse uh, you know needs and desires in a way being secreted into this uh, uh, neighborhood full of different clusters for this nomadic community now at that time the client and the users were the same people the nomadic community but in 2013 one of the last projects that she makes before she passes away the client is the mp travel museum another point that i'd like to make which again i couldn't because i didn't want to go on too long is that the mp tribal museum began not as an idea of the culture department cultural ministry it began as an idea which was initiated by this janjati um, evam uh, boli vikas academy and they wanted their succeeding generations of adivasi families to be acquainted with adivasi art forms they joined hands with the culture department in 2011 and then the museum was inaugurated in 2013 between 2011 and 2013 many things happened and instead of the adivasis uh, adivasi artists becoming the leaders of the museum the culture department takes over even a woman architect of great renown like revti kamath was sidelined that is why i talk about the fire hazard and how she writes to the authorities and says look all this 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 clutter this this, this overwhelming proliferation because when i went to the museum the first thing that scared me was it everything was covered which means that if there is a fire there i mean everything would be alight you know so uh, so 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 then there was a lot of this kind of correspondence between revti and then the museum authorities the person the taxi driver who took us to uh, uh, to the tribal uh, museum he was also the taxi driver who used to ferry revti back and forth from the museum and he was talking about how distraught and disappointed she was towards the end of the project because the curators and exhibition designers were just taking over the space uh, and not paying any heed to any kinds of regulations so i'm just showing from the design context since that is our symposium what happens when an architect is working with clients or users uh, the with 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 people with a community which is both the client and the user and which has the agency to determine its neighborhood and a place like the mp tribal museum which is then taken over by the where she's answerable to the state and the culture department uh thank you for that uh, nancy so uh I think we will open. I can see one question in the chat box. I may have. Uh, I will come in again at the end. But I I must say that the notion of affordances itself is a very interesting one, because it is less than about a certain kind of clientelism, if I may call it, mm. where you have the patron, uh, you have in this case the state. you have designers and architects who are employed and then you have another chain of clientelism where the participating tribal arts is coming instead of that you think about whether it's revati kamath's architecture or whether it's uh, harchan singh bhatti's attempt to create a different part of more participatory space i think the idea of affordances becomes then a very important one uh, because there are different affordances her her chan singh bhatti is afforded by being trained local artist who is from in athri trained i actually met him uh, without realizing that he's part of it they all hang around the cafeteria jungers affordance was different and in a way becoming the individual artist turned back on it right he's re he's reduced to a laborer uh there are other affordances maybe uh durga bai or alatri bai or puri bai are taking away and so i think that becomes the interesting thing so that even in terms of design and overarching conception uh there is clearly a hierarchy of stakeholders here but the fact that there can be so many different kinds of affordances allows for both the polyvalence of such a setting the fact that things can be undone also exactly say you're not very sure how long a mural is made to last it can be made it can be undone mm. 
uh, you know, is one of the things. And But anyway, so I think your response clarified this, that it is less about uh, a judgmental position, mm. but more about possibilities. Mm. So let's assume that Revati Kamath had one kind of vision or having worked in a completely participatory space. The problem then becomes, the, as I said again, the form of the museum and the state, uh, where the museum and the state, and even if it's a, an organization which is not the state, there is an element of exchange which at one point will become appropriation rather than pure exchange. And I think that is the cusp or that's the push that you are leading us to see that when does, when can affordance become true authorship of a certain mm. kind? Mm. And I think uh, that's a very, very important point and we can talk about this. Um, so thank you. I mean, I was, I, I was following the conversation as best as I could, even though I kept you know, being ejected from the meeting today. Um, but um, um, I also, I think I caught the end of the presentation where you're talking about, you know, the quote by Buribai that shouldn't a tribal museum be made by the tribals themselves and also as, you know, the current discussion, the, the turn that it took and talking about the museum design, um, you know, as a living performative space uh, uh, where the community has the agency to uh, look into how they want their continuous ontologies uh, in that sense to be presented uh, or to be uh, create a discursive uh, scenario around. Um, but I also would, you know, like to uh, point towards what you mentioned about um, Buribai's uh, large uh, mural and the idea of the ephemeral versus the permanent. And this is a point within uh, any museum that, you know, and especially so when it has got an ethnographic or a tribal um, idea to it, especially where, um, uh, you know, tribal art form, the art forms that are made on the village walls are never meant to be permanent vis-a-vis -vis what, uh, you know, an artist or an individual artist coming out of the community uh, now paints on a canvas or a paper and it becomes, or, or a wall mural and it, it raises the question of um, this, this very interesting question between, uh, you know, how we look at certain uh, art forms or, and how the, the change from uh, an, un, you know, like I, you said this in the beginning, the valorization of the community over the individual artist, but turning it around that how then we look at uh, art forms coming out of certain communities. And um, it also reminds me, interestingly, of K.G. Subramaniam's, uh, you know, wall mural in Kalabhavan, which he had painted twice. And it was also a participatory dialogic mode where students and teachers were also part of making that. Um, but he, and he also, uh, quite, um, you know, strongly reiterated the fact that he did not want it to be permanent, that it, he wanted it to be open to change of elements. So hence bringing in that idea of uh, impermanence or the living tradition, but in an inverted uh, format. So maybe you can reflect a little on, on those areas as well. Thank you for your response, um, Ushmita. So one of the things that I was th uh, thinking about when you were talking about the ephemeral mural, one that can be erased and then remade. So of course, in my uh, paper, uh, I uh, also alluded to some logistical nightmares that you might have, or also questions of authorship. Uh, but apart from this, uh, it also reminds me uh, of an essay that actually Rustam Barucha wrote for me when I was the editor of Art India. Uh, this was uh, an issue on um, the contemporary museum. And uh, he spoke about, uh, you know, I mean, the possibility of borrowing the Deridian trope of, trope of erasure. So, you know, I mean, how we have our floor, uh, floor drawings, you know, you make them ritual floor drawings and then you erase them and then you remake them again, you know. So the sense of um, erasure, visarjan, as we would say. And uh, I am open to all of these different uh, strategies and processes uh, as far as we are as far as we conduct them uh, with criticality 
as far as we uh, also ask uh, all the right questions uh, and in, in a way to understand what the consequences of these acts would be. So uh, again, I'm not judging one over the other, the ephemeral versus the permanent, but I'm just raising questions about, uh, yes, uh, it would be wonderful if you could just have a museum of constantly changing displays, um, uh, an ephemeral museum. Um, and, um, uh, but but uh, I was also, for example, thinking uh, then is there a way in which you can document Buribai's mural if somebody else comes and paints over it, you know? So uh, how do we find ways to also secure these narratives? Uh, because you must remember that what is done in a ritual tradition is no longer the I mean it's it's it, the, the 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 intentionality behind it, the consciousness behind it is completely different when it happens in a secular context, uh, and. Uh, uh, apart from documentation, I was also thinking, for example, at the Crafts Museum, uh, when we uh, when we've had uh, when we've had uh, Jodhendra Jain, of course, uh, that was uh, you know very in, uh, an, an enlightened leadership, uh, uh, you know, I mean, which which then gave rise to some marvelous things uh, at the Crafts Museum. But then uh, in recent years, we've seen how the Crafts Museum, for instance, just erased uh, the work of this Mithila artist. Uh, so, uh, and, and there was a whole furor about it and, and the cultural bureaucrat just said, oh, you know, I mean, uh, an, another group, a bunch of mythal artists can just come there and uh, create another mural. What's a big deal? You know, like, why are you making such a big song and dance about it? So this is the question that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, that, that, that then I would ask, you know, so, I mean, are we then also thinking of, uh, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be a permanent display, but then how do we also in a way secure the memory? Of, of this of this mural. And again, the way in which uh, this Mithila artist's work was treated was again this idea that, oh, I mean, five other artists, you know, can go and make the same work. So what's the big deal, you know? So again, it's about this, this whole attitude, uh, you know, where again, they are just seen not as individuated artists, but as just, you know, members of the community and the work is just seen as anonymous and interchangeable. So these are the reasons why I brought in all these questions as well. Again, as I said, I'm not judging one over the other. I'm not interested in binaries or any essential of any kind. I'm open to a variety of strategies and processes as far as we are eternally vigilant and critical. I hope that answers your question. I don't seem to see any questions. Uh, the one chat that was there says, thank you for a repetitive talk, Aparna Raman. I need to leave immediately for another meeting. Hope to connect with Nancy and Tapati later. So, and I cannot see any in the Q&A either. So, let me then, uh, it could be coming in. Let me ask you something that is not a comment, but it's actually a question and how hard it is to answer. Is this question coming, a perspective that is coming from within the the community or the figure of the tribal artist, right? You're, so you're mm -hmm. trying your best here is to listen to their voices, uh, understand what they may expect or not expect of it. And that just becomes an interesting question that this idea of whether you return, whether you make an individual artist out of a figure from a party community like Jungar, who's not representing a long uh, lineage, but is actually producing a column himself. How far you individuate the figure and how far you still club him as part of a community. Now, I wanted to ask that this pull between an individuated identity, which is nonetheless produced by others, because a jungle happens because of Swami Nathan, a Gangabai happened because of Jyotindra Jain. I remember Jyotindra Jain refusing to admit that there could be no Gangabai without a Jyotindra Jain. And I believe that, that that enabling element is always there. So I'm asking whether you actually feel that if you were to take the view of Jangar or Ladri Bhai or Puri Bhai, what is their status on being the individual artist? The reason I'm asking this is that I've often heard that when an artist then attracts national global attention, begins to travel the world, becomes a coveted community, 
their positions, their return, they're caught in a world where they're neither then part of the communities to which they came from, nor can they ever, ever be part of the modern world. Somewhere there's a median space in which they're trapped. And, you know, whether jungle or whether whether many other Santosh Das, the Mithila artists are continuous. And so for the contemporary to get the status of, uh, for the folk art to get a status of being a contemporary innovative form where the individual artist is a process. And it's a process which has been now promoted by galleries and agents and collectors. But it seems that uh, a position of either one, because there's no sense of return then to the community. So I wanted to get a sense from the people you've spoken to, their voices. Uh, what is the sense they have? Do they feel they can fully disentangle themselves from the community and become the individual whose style is nonetheless tied to what we may call a tribal color? Whether Jangar invents it or Gangu Bai does, you can do the contemporary, but the form is still something else. So, uh, do you have a sense of them, of this uh, pull at both ends, if you could say? Because clearly, to enter the museum and the market is hugely enabling, is hugely enabling for them to become to participate in a project like this, not just commercial and financial gain, may have also given them a certain status within that. And so how do they feel about this new status and how far can they be absorbed back within a larger communal, community space in which they work? You've asked a very important question, uh, Tapti, and um, I don't think I have uh, a definite answer because this is something that I've been asking myself from the late 20s when I started writing about this, this distance or gap between the arts and the crafts and having then met uh, many artists of Adivasi origin over the years and talked to them. Uh, this is a very difficult question because as you correctly pointed out, uh, there, there is no way in which they can disentangle themselves from the world that they uh, that they belong to and the, the and the world that they have now adopted uh, and i think that the question also is not really so much about disentangling themselves or it's not about these binaries of the individual or the community or the collectivity in fact i actually showed jangar singh sham's work in the in the 2012 gwangju biennial which i co-curated in my section which was called logging in and out of collectivity. This is precisely to answer your question, that instead of seeing these as binaries of uh, absolute individuation, you know, and the rupture from the community, uh, or absolute sense of belonging, instead of these kinds of extremes, this, no, this, this in-between space of how does the individual individuate, <laughs> negotiate with both the community that they belong to and with the larger world. And the fact that Jangar could not itself shows us that the fact that Jangar died in, in this process of trying to negotiate uh, with, with the world that he had adopted, uh, itself shows us that there are no easy answers. That what we are left with is a whole lot of unease. What we are left with is uh, the, the sad fact that, as I've always said from various uh, platforms, that the, the, the subaltern artists are not going to, however much of a renown, how much of a how much of a renown they might, uh, you know, I mean, achieve in the end, because our society is so socially, politically, and economically unequal, they will always be treated in an unequal manner. And you need the feisty buri bais, and you need the durga bais. I mean, I'm I'm saying yeah because these are mainly women artists. Uh, Nen Kusya, who I also spoke to when I was uh, at in Bhopal, and in, these are the women artists who, when you talk to them, they will talk about how they 
they loved the idea that they've achieved this renown. Even Durga Bai told me that. So then I told her, you know, I mean, now that you, this this happened to you, she said, yes, I got this mural commission at uh, at um, uh, at the MP Tribal Museum. I was also shown at the Kochi Museum's biennial. She was shown by Anita Dubey, you know. So uh, and she's done. Sorry, her... if I could interrupt, but somewhere we yes. to say that becoming interior decorator, so you're getting a commission, yeah, for then going and doing a rich man's house, yeah. Uh, is a commercial opportunity and obviously yes. they're selling their skill and their art. You seem to have a sense of disapproval of them making this passage of doing pure community art or remaining true to their vocation as tribal artists to becoming interior designers because artists are doing the same. They're selling their skills. So let's look at yeah. it in both ends. There are artists who double up as interior designers and will do yeah. designer saris and also yeah. do their artwork and so yes. tribal artists. So maybe <laughs> that's the dialogue between commissions, markets, yes. selling, yeah. that we need to accept as a part of this art yes. world rather than to say yeah. that is wrong. Huh? Yeah. That is there. Yeah. No, I mean, I... See, I agree. See, again, it's not. It's not about being judgmental. That, like, I mean, of course, we know that. I mean, you know, uh, we uh, contemporary uh, metropolitan anglophone artists also work on commissions. I'm not denying that, but there is a difference when a subaltern artist works on a commission and a contemporary artist with all her privileges. Uh, the fact that she speaks English uh, and make does a commission. An Atul Dodia doing a commission um, for an elite home is not the same as Durga Bai doing a commission in Jackie Shroff's uh, or Rani Mukherjee's house. So e that also needs to be taken into consideration. And therefore, of of course, the, on, uh, I'm not being judgmental. In fact, I'm trying to say that we have to be vigilant as always. And what does it mean? Because as I said, again with Harchandran, uh, uh, you know, I mean, um, but, but Mr. Mr. Bhatti, he is also creating avenues for securing their livelihood, which I also mentioned earlier. So I mean, and he's also a friend, as I said, he also has empathy. So this is, I'm just saying that these are unequal situations, and there's no getting away from there. I'm, I'm not saying that there's a problem if, 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 if Durga Bai or Buri Bai goes and does a commission in an elite home, you know, but uh, it's, it's always a question of, you know, I mean, what happens when the curator and the exhibition designer becomes a middle man or a middle woman. So it's all these intricate in-between positions, which we need to be vigilant and critical about. That's the point I'm making. But there was something else that you said, which was very interesting, uh, which I wanted to respond to, but unfortunately, sorry, it'll come back to me. Uh, there was something that you said, which uh, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm sure it'll, it, it, it will come back. Yeah, I'm always troubled yeah. by the fact that the contemporary folk artist or the tribal artist yeah. remains tied to, to a certain language Mm. That is that establishes him mm. in the community, even as his theme begins to mm. change. I'm thinking of Bhaskar Chitrakar, who is reinventing a Kalika style and has become selling, but he is a Chitrakar. And you know, he uses it as an enabling form. Mm. And it's a long discussion, but thank you for bringing it on the board. Uh, I'll read out a question that has come up from Vishal Khandelwal, who's also a participant in this thing. Thank you for this talk, Nancy, which opens up in many different directions. I was interested to know more about the kinds of cataloging or recording done at the museum, which you alluded to. How does the museum codify or classify this knowledge at the institutional level? And what kinds of materials does it use to do so? So this idea of the ephemeral, mm -hmm. but does a record remain, you know? Yes. So uh, I, I, when I when I was there, I was trying to look for some brochures, um, and uh, I, I, much of the material that I found uh, in terms of the mission statement, etc., was found. I found it on the net. Um, so um, as far as I know, I haven't, uh, you know, I mean, uh, seen um, uh, a lot of writing on on the museum or or by the museum about uh, about its collection and so forth. But I did find a lot of material on the net. Uh, and a lot of pictures uh, as well. Um, uh, I think that this question definitely should be, um, you know, I mean, it, sh it should be addressed to Mr. Bhatti uh, because I think he would be able to, uh, you know, talk about the various publications that the museum uh, has brought out now since uh, 2013, the museum has, uh, uh, has uh, you know, been uh, in play. Um, uh, 
I, I mean, I, I would be curious to know as well about, uh, you know, I mean, what kind of documentation exists? As I was saying, I mean, if there are ephemeral murals and what happens uh, to those ephemeral murals, um, uh, maybe, you know, in 10 years time, they will come out with publications and perhaps a record of, of what they have done in a decade. And then we will be able to evaluate better. There's a question from uh, Tanishka. Uh, which says, does the design of the museum and its exhibitions in any way acknowledge the violence that was historically done upon indigenous communities and continues to be in the name of development and progress? Is there any way of accessing political histories? So as I said, the MP Tribal Museum itself, of course, does not talk about, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the violence against these communities. That's why I, I look at Durga Bai's mural at the entrance on the, on the origin myth of the Narmada River. And I talk about the affordance, the fact that as a viewer, user of this museum, uh, I would connect it with the Narmada Vachao Andolan. But it, within the museum itself, no. That is why I make the proposal for a room for rebellion, a room for jangar within the museum itself. As far as histories uh, of uprisings uh, I mean, uh, go, uh, a, a lot of work has been done, whether it's on the Santal uprising or on Birsa Munda, um, uh, which, 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 uh, you know, which, which you can read. But within, uh, within the museum itself, uh, these questions are not taken up. Uh, this uh, the, the museum's approach is still very much more about you know the web of life, the cycle of life. Uh, it's an ethnographic, anthropological, cosmogonic uh, kind of uh, approach. Ask a question about the pedagogic agenda of such a museum. Hmm. Uh, it is about so. Uh, of course, public response, one doesn't know. Since there's very little signage in the museum from what I've seen, so in a way, none of those things are in place. Uh, if there is, so of course, one of the agenda is to make it a living museum. But then, the you know, this idea of the folk art as a living art is a long tradition. Here, they're actually experimenting with a kind where you know, the, you have a sense of a lived environment, a world of belief, a cosmography in which you enter. But it, what is the takeaway? And I think this could be that are there information, which of course is there in most anthropological museums. There's a lot of text panels which will tell you about the work they do, the material they use, etc. cetera. Uh, so again, who does the museum? You're asked the question, what is being museumized? Hmm. But who is the museum for also that they, when, say, young school students come in or an art community walks in, they may be interested in processes of making. When an average viewer comes in, uh, what is the takeaway? And does a museum, does somebody like Bhatti or others have a sense of a pedagogic purpose that this museum could have? Um. I haven't asked this uh, question to Mr. Bhatti, of course, so I don't want to speak on his behalf, but from what I can see in terms of what he's done at the museum, so that from those manifestations, we can speculate. So, for example, uh, like if you look at Durga Bai's mural, you have the whole story uh, of the origin myth uh, of the sacred river Narmada, for instance. And as I said, then Durga Bai and others, uh, the, it's in a tiny print. So, so then they're also signaling something that, you know, what, what you're going to then take away is not... Uh, artists like Durga Bai or Subhash Vyam, uh, who have become renowned artists in their own rights, but they are still being sort of seen as being represented by, or represented, represented by the community or representing their community and its folklore. Uh, so, so that was my grouse. And I think that, uh, you know, th there, are, there are ways in which you can also activate uh, these pedagogical panels. Uh, I mean, what if you were to have Durga Bai's mural on the sacred river Narmada and also have uh, photographs of, uh, the, of Adivasi women, uh, you know, fighting for their rights in the, uh, in the Narmada Bachao Andolan uh, movement, you know, so, so things like that. I think that, that, you know, as I said, can we have uh, artists from Buster also talking about the Maoist insurgency within the museum? Then I think, uh, you, you know, I mean, th th that pedagogy could happen textually, it could happen through photographs. Uh, what, we, what we require is the rub, something, 
we, what we require is friction. The problem that happens when you have this overload of sensory stimuli uh, is that the, everything becomes interchangeable with everything else. The tree, the moon, the moon, which is an artificial moon hanging there, uh, the lurid colors, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the branches, the houses, it, it all just cancels everything out. And you then sort of become part of, as what I said, which is very dangerous, this eternal slippage between the Adivasi artist and the forest. You know, and as I also uh, said, I mean, you know, again, uh, it's not true that the Adivasi art uh, artist is only a forest dweller and lives outside the pale of caste society. Actually, as Shashank Kela, the historian, uh, says, uh, you know, the Adivasi um, community is always living both, uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know it, it, it sort of lives in confluence with and also in conflict against the caste-based uh, agrarian society, you know. So again, these are very, very complex uh, issues. And... Uh, uh, I think that we we definitely need much more um, you know vigilant critical pedagogy, uh, and and maybe it can also be done not just through wall panels because not everybody can read whether it is in English or in Hindi. It could also be done orally. Uh, you know what if we act? What if also the balladeers and the bards uh, from various communities can come and and you know um, create contemporary ballads, which then uh, you know bring in. Uh, all the issues that they wish to talk about. You know, it doesn't only have to be the Narmada Bachao Andolan, uh, because as I also say in my paper, uh, an Adivasi art doesn't just become contemporary because it is uh, relating directly to a political uh, issue. You know, it is already political uh, and uh, critical uh, of the capitalist scene and, and, and it's very contemporary, you know. So I think there are, there are many ways in which uh, these activations uh, can be generated. I think uh, I cannot see any more questions. So oh, there are a couple of questions. They are in the question and answer chat box. Okay. I can see. Um, there's one from Kripa. She says, taking from Tapati's question and Nancy's stating in her presentation about Jangar's Kalam, reinvention of the art form, there are a new group of artists reinventing their art who need not fit a find a fit into either of the worlds they belong to or feed off. That's more of an observation. And Anup Daniel also says, not a question, but a curiosity. How would you imagine that such a museum would have panned out in case the works, dioramas, etc., would have been documented and displayed digitally? Say, maybe through virtual reality or mixed reality mediums. Won't the scope of documentation and identity expand, or is it such a display too distant from the folk or tribal context? Um, if I understand uh, the question correctly, I mean, this is, an, of course, in a speculative mode. I mean, can, can there be virtual displays of these dioramas? But do, do you mean virtual displays? Uh, 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 of, of what is done on site and that, that we do not have a, 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 a museum on site at all and just have a virtual museum that, that, which can then be annotated by people on the net. Um, so I'm, I haven't uh, completely got the question or the drift of it. But uh, the one thing I would say is that I, I think we should use uh, every available uh, media uh, to uh, disseminate uh, information about this uh, museum because I think it is it is a very important effort and it needs a variety of critical annotations, uh, which is what will activate the museum and make it much more interesting. Uh, another thing I would say is that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, an on-site museum is extremely important, uh, apart from the fact that it can also have a virtual avatar because, uh, as Ladli Bai says, uh, uh, people, uh, the, the artists, as well as their extended families and their Adivasi mm -hmm. friends, they all come and they see the museum as a, as a space, a neighborhood, uh, where they can come in, they can talk, share chai, share stories. Uh, and this is one incredible thing that I found in the museum, which is that, uh, you know, every evening uh, artists would come in, uh, uh, you know, they would sit there, have their samosas and chai. Uh, there was really a sense of belonging. And 
which which you which you would not find uh, in uh, you know I mean in in a, in, a, in other kinds of spaces, white cube spaces, or at the NGMA uh, in Bombay, for instance, because always there would be this comparison, this horrible, pernicious, punitive comparison with the metropolitan anglophone artist. So that gets done away with, and what you have instead here is a place for belonging. This artist is not sub uh, this the subaltern artist is not in comparison with or to somebody else. The artist is. And I think that you know when 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 we, we we can actually stop at the artist is a contemporary artist, and then let's see what Shiori has to express. That for me was something that was uh, very very heartening. It's a final question by, and maybe we will make this. I can't see any more by Tanya Talwar. Uh, thanks you for your talk. Uh, is there a difference you noticed in the taxonomies used by the museum curators when trying to classify the everyday lives and spaces inhabited by people of the tribal communities from what one might see when representing the ethnographic objects, see as done at the Government Museum at Chennai, often similar to colonial taxonomies uh, at ethnographic museums in Europe? Do they shed light on the term tribal itself, both historically and what it means and is perceived as today and the gaps therein. So here, I also wanted to ask you a bit also on why the term Janjati as against Adivasi, uh, and do the people feel comfortable with this, this alternative term that is used? I mean, does it really, sub uh, redefine the category in some sense. But anyway, maybe the yeah. main question is really about yeah. two ways, the everyday life and then others who wish to frame it. I think within the museum, the everyday life is constantly being framed in an ethnographic uh, and, 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 and an anthropological uh, approach. Uh, as far as the question of Janjati goes, it's more a kind of bureaucratic term where, uh, uh, because they translate, the, it's, it's in English, it's called the MP Tribal Museum. And in Hindi, the translation, which is on the plaque, I'm not saying it from the top of my head, it's there, right there at the entrance. It says the Janjati Sangrale. So that is, uh, it's, a, it's an official diktat. Now, uh, the, when, you, when you say Janjati, uh, as I was explaining in my paper, the, 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 the Jan aspect actually deals with this notion of the clan. And the clan again, which is again uh, sort of interpreted through this notion of you know exotic primitivism, etc. But exotic primitivism, which is then shown in contrast with jati, which is the which is how the society is defined through through uh, through caste based groups. So there is this kind of you know I mean uh, very disturbing uh, kind of uh, sort of uh, I would say um, uh, um, a positioning of these two words jan and jati you know the exotic primitivism and then uh, uh, the, 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 the the caste based society and as I explained earlier uh, through Shashank Kela and other historians uh, you know although we've always been taught that the tribals are outside the pale of caste society actually they are uh, they, they are imbricated in caste based society in in many different ways. So I don't know whether it answers the question about are the museum curators trying to devise an alternative taxonomy. I mean, one which is assuming that there's a long inheritance of colonial and then national ethnographic divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so does a museum which brings the artist in as participants and tries to give them a different sense of possession, ownership, makers of the museum, uh, is there a different taxonomy that is emerging at all of, let's assume the idea of what does it mean? Is the tribal an identity that you can wear now with greater pride and greater sense of entitlement, which may not be just governmental? I mean, I know that there's a whole system of reservation and your, you know, certain things, but I'm thinking if it's, so both are governmental categories, Adivasis and, 
Jan Jakti is right. So one may have a greater moral thing about original inhabitants, but today they're both government. No, Adivasi. Uh... I mean, again, has to be annotated in uh, historically, as I was talking about the first time it is used by Avi Thakkar, the Gandhi, Gandhian social worker, um, the 20s, 30s, when he was uh, to work uh, in the Chota Nagpur region with the Bill uh, tribal groups. Uh, but then again, as I explained there, the Adivasi is still seen to the Gandhian approach of, approach of paternalism. The Adivasi today, uh, and especially the Adivasis of Central India, that's again another thing that I need to clarify. Uh, if you're talking about the notion of a, a, tri a tribe or a, um, a, a tribe in the Northeast, for instance, the various tribes in the Northeast, that's very different versus the Adivasi communities in Central India. So even the term Adivasi itself is, is an unstable category. It's a category which is uh, importantly Adivasi in Central India, especially it is a term which is which has political valency. As I explained in the genealogy, Jaipal Singh Munda, uh, you know, starts using the term Adivasi. It's a regional inflection on the Sanskrit Adivasi, you know, and he was the president of the Adivasi Mahasabha. Uh, and he in the Constituent Assembly in 1946 talks about how his uh, people have suffered so much over the years, you know. So, 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 so therefore, this term has a political valency. So for Central India, when they're using the term Adivasi, it's, it's, a, way, it's a tool of resistance. They're fighting for their rights. Uh, you know, I mean, in Central India, the Adivasis are constantly been, have constantly been displaced in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, uh, through state intervention, big dams, mining projects. So there is a whole, uh, you know, um, a, a political genealogy that we need to take into consideration. But uh, so yeah, these are these are really complex. Uh, but I, I have tried to bring in as 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 much complexity as possible to also explain this genealogy. To talk uh, to just briefly answer. Tanya's question before I forget uh, is that um, uh, about this, uh, you know, tax, the, the taxonomy of pedagogy in ethnographic or um, anthropological museums, um, because I did not have enough space in my paper, um, uh, I mean, right now, th there is also the state museum. Uh, you know, in Bhopal, the Manav Sangrale, which uh, Swaminathan was associated with. And the, this, the Manav uh, Sangrale, even when I visited it um, in 2018, it was a little tatty and run down. But uh, whether it was its display, uh, ethnographic and anthropological display, or its pedagogy, it was much more to the point. And I would say uh, even... Uh, uh, even, uh, I mean, I would go so far as to say it, it even included uh, a certain degree of criticality, uh, you know, because perhaps on the committees of the Manav Sangrale, there had been uh, progressive uh, intellectuals, artists, and bureaucrats. So uh, if you would, let's say, compare the pedagogy uh, from between the Manav, Manav Sangrale and the tribal museum, you would find a difference. Like to, which is what makes Popal such an interesting site. Mm, we have three models of uh, a kind of living museums, and and the other one is actually where people come and construct huts mm. and settlements and habitats mm. and go away. So anyway, Ushmita, would you like to round up? Yes, <laughs> thank because you so I don't much. Think there are more questions, so we have addressed them all. No, I. There are no more questions, and uh, thank you so much, Nancy, uh, for I think a very important um, conversation on what it means to have the museum space as a representative of living cultures, and uh, and how uh, we need to look at certain uh, you know understanding of what the contemporary is. And also, I think you raised very important questions about how design, uh, especially in uh, view of the, uh, the seminar, how design acts into uh, generating ideas within the viewership and how uh, these could be channelized to uh, you know, broaden the, the conversation field on what these taxonomies and these uh, ideas about uh, you know, ethnography or fluid and ontology, ontology is really uh, mean. Um, uh, so there's one, is there a question? Um, okay, there's uh, just one more and I'll read it because we are running out of time now. Uh, and this is from Santosh Sakinada. 
Um, he says it's more of a response, and it seems that the museum projects uh, slide shift from the ethnographic framework to producing an aesthetic and sensorial space for the spectator to experience. It is again a spectator consumer that has capacities to experience such a space while it alters the way of representation through curation. It does not seem to affect the asymmetrical power relation between the spectator consumer and the position of the tribals, which is not very different from the earlier position. And I think Nancy, you have um, you know, discussed, uh, touched upon this, as has Tapatibi. So um, I think we all leave here today with um, a, a lot more awareness about what design can mean within the study of a larger community. Um, so I, I would like to thank you again um, for your presence here today. Thank you, Tapatibi. And tomorrow we uh, convene back at six uh, with Professor Shiva Kumar's um, lecture. And I thank everyone again for your presence. And have a good evening. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Yeah. Tapatibi. May I just thank uh, both of you. Uh, uh, thank you. Tapti and Ushmita for being such great interlocutors and uh, I rarely get such feedback because I often think that I'm just writing into a black hole and there are no responses to my work over the decades so uh, thank you this is very heartening thank you for taking my work seriously and responding to it um, and I value that thank you so much thank you and I wish I was you know I had turned to my phone much earlier my <laughs> laptop just wasn't working today. Um, thank you so much. And, and I hope this will be one of more conversations. Sure. Will, yes. This will yeah. unfold. Uh, yes. I'm seeing parallels with the work I did on the Durga Pujas, but we talk about that on some sure. other occasion. Sure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye.